For those of you who think that the Victorians were just these prim and proper people who couldn't even bear to look at an exposed piano leg, then you haven't read Robert Browning's 1836 poem, Porphyria's Lover, a dramatic monologue that involves illicit love, sexual perversity, unconventional gender roles, murder, and madness. In a mere 60 lines, we watch Porphyria enter her lover's home, make a fire, make herself comfortable, and sit down next to the narrator, who very suddenly strangles her to death with her very own hair. And there they sit together, in perfect harmony, she dead, and he, having captured and prolonged a moment that can now never be altered. Join me today in this study in madness as we take a look into the narrator's psychological complexities and what Browning may be trying to say from an authorial distance and through the voice of a madman. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Whitney Costers, professor of English, and I've created this channel to share with you audiobooks of classic stories, as well as my unabridged lectures on literature, research, and writing. If you're here because you like the macabre, then be sure to watch my lecture on Poe's The Telltale Heart, Browning's My Last Duchess, and Faulkner's A Rose for Emily. Now, Browning was the master of the dramatic monologue, which means one person speaks to a silent listener who does not speak back. So as you read this poem, ask yourself who the speaker is talking to. After all, there are only two characters in this poem, and one of them ultimately ends up dead. Now, this poem was originally published simply as Porphyria. A few years later, however, in 1842, it was published alongside Johannes Agricola in meditation under the collective title Madhouse Cells. And Johannes Agricola also features a psychotic man who commits crimes out of the belief that he's already saved, so it doesn't matter. So I think it's clear that Browning indicates that our narrator as well is psychotic. And this is indicated immediately in the opening lines of the poem, which clue us into the fact that the narrator is insecure, angry, needy, and very desirous of power and control. And you might be saying, well, what do you mean? The opening lines are actually a description of the weather. But the way in which it's described indicates that the weather is either a metaphor for or a reflection of the narrator's state of mind. Now, I say this because it is personified, and more importantly, the description is in the narrator's own words. He says, The rain set early in tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break. So this is an example of what we call pathetic fallacy, meaning the narrator is projecting his own mood onto unfeeling objects. The wind cannot be sullen and a lake can't be vexed. Like Shakespeare's Prospero, a tempest is boiling inside the narrator who admits to listening with a heart fit to break. And it's hinted that the narrator suffers from these moods often since he says, the rain set early in tonight, as though the rain or these moods always set in, it's just tonight they came on sooner than expected. But suddenly, the tone and mood of the poem change when we are told, in glides Porphyria, straight she shut the cold out and the storm, and kneeled and made the cheerless grate, blaze up and all the cottage warm. So there's a lot of indirect characterization in this poem, meaning we learn about the characters without being explicitly told descriptors about them. We know that this is not Porphyria's first or probably even second or third time here. I mean, she has clearly been here before as she just glides on in. You know, that's a very loaded word here in this poem in that it suggests that she moves with confidence, independence, or even a bit of haughtiness or superiority. I mean, remember, this is all from the madman's perspective, so take it with a grain of salt. Notice that she doesn't wait for the narrator to open the door and that she immediately begins preparing things as though this were her own home. And it's also important to observe that she shuts the storm out, literally, by closing the door, but I also think figuratively. Unlike the Vex narrator, her presence causes, creates cheer and warmth. He then tells us, which done, she rose and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl and laid her soiled gloves by, untied her hat and let the damp hair fall. And last, she sat down by my side and called me. In other words, the narrator just told us that he was not her first priority. In fact, he remained unnoticed until she was ready to notice him. And he, like the wind, is sullen over this. 
After making the fire, she takes the time to make herself comfortable, removing her wet clothing and soiled gloves. And, you know, she's been literally walking through a storm to get to the narrator. So it seems very reasonable that she would want to warm up and remove wet clothing before giving him her full attention. But of course, the narrator doesn't see it this way. Now, the word soiled is very significant. It does not only mean that her gloves are literally dirty, but it also refers to the illicit and very socially unacceptable affair that these two are having. Don't forget that the title is Porphyria's Lover. They are lovers, they are not married. And what you must know is that there was a very real double standard at this time that vilified women for sex outside of the marriage and generally looked the other way when men did it. So Porphyria's reputation is one that society would see as stained or marked or soiled. That Porphyria would be in this man's house alone, especially at night, is wholly immoral and very controversial. Now, we know that the narrator is extremely upset that Porphyria has overlooked him because he says, and last, she sat down by my side and called me. But when she calls him, he says, no voice replied. He is, of course, referring to himself. Now, I read this as a petulant little boy saying, oh, finally, you're finally going to pay attention to me, but who's so upset at being disregarded that he's now not going to talk to her. In essence, the narrator is an emotionally weak figure who, like a child, is throwing a fit because he's not the center of her attention. It is clear that of the two, he occupies the weaker and more subordinate position. Porphyria is active and in control of the situation, taking charge and preparing the home and herself as she sees fit. In stark contrast, up until this point, the narrator has done literally nothing but pout. He has not spoken. He has not prepared his home for her arrival. He has not greeted her. He remains passive, inactive, dependent. Ironically, it is he who is bound to the home, waiting on her to call on him, while she occupies the public sphere, a space entitled to men in the 19th century since they were given greater freedoms and opportunities than women at this time. This power dynamic continues when we are told that it is she who calls him to her. And even more shocking, Porphyria is also the one to initiate the physical intimacy. He says, she put my arm around her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare and all her yellow hair displaced and stooping made my cheek lie there and spread over all her yellow hair. In other words, in this relationship, Porphyria dominates and controls. And it is in this illicit moment as lovers that she literally puts him in a position in which his head stoops beneath hers. She remains above him symbolically and physically. And in their embrace, she comforts and holds him almost as though he were a child. I mean, he acts like one, right? And she wraps him up in her hair. This is a very significant dynamic that you must not overlook. He goes on to say, murmuring how she loved me, she, too weak for all her heart's endeavor, to set its struggling passion free from pride and vainer ties dissever and give herself to me forever. So we don't know exactly what Porphyria's situation is. I mean, all we know is her pride and vanity prevent her from giving herself fully to the narrator. This could mean that she is a married woman. I mean, her name being Porphyria means purple, a color associated with royalty since purple dyes were extremely expensive to produce at this time. So this suggests that the narrator and Porphyria are of two different classes. She, dressed as she was, has been out, possibly at an engagement that the narrator being of lower status could not join. So she may be willing to have the affair, but not forever. And it seems that this is what ultimately upsets him the most. And here, in my opinion, is the most disturbing part. It's not that he kills her, it's why he kills her. Remember, we are dealing with an insecure, jealous, dependent, subordinate, petulant, emotionally immature man. This murder, of course, is not premeditated. It's an impulsive choice driven by the narrator's desire to control his lover at the ideal moment. He says, be sure I looked up at her eyes. I mean, notice he's still looking up at her. He's still in a submissive position. Happy and proud, at last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell and still it grew while I debated what to do. Now, that moment, she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do. The narrator admits that this is his ideal moment. 
To him, it's the pinnacle of their affair because Porphyria, a woman who refuses to give into this affair fully, a woman who doesn't fall all over him the minute she sees him, a woman who merely murmurs her love for him, suddenly worships him, and in this moment, she is his. He says it twice even. She was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure, and good. Now, this isn't necessarily the truth. I mean, even in their position to one another, um, it's contradictory to what he's saying. He's still looking up at her, a position that suggests if there's any worshiping going on, it is he worshiping her. But obviously, we are listening to an unreliable narrator, a man who has made clear how desperate he is for Porphyria's love and attention. And what he reveals to us is his greatest desire. It's not to be with Porphyria forever. I mean, it's not even Porphyria herself. It is to permanently possess her in a state of full subservience to and deification of him. Finally, believing he has captured the pinnacle of his greatest desire and fearful that it is merely an ephemeral moment that he can never relive, he decides to make time stand still, to freeze the moment in time so that it will never change. Have you ever said to someone, oh, I just wish we could be like this forever? Well, our narrator takes it quite literally. This is his moment. In a sudden fit of desperation, frustration, excitement, or insecurity, he weaponizes her own body against her, winding her hair around her little throat and strangling her to death. And it's literally as he is committing the crime that he begins to change the power dynamics between them. He begins to infantilize her, calling her throat little, thereby diminishing her power and dominance over him. And he will continue to diminish her to full objectification, ultimately referring to her only as it by the end of the poem. This is a process that by default empowers and emboldens him. He goes on to say, no pain felt she. I am quite sure she felt no pain. Presumptuous, yeah? As a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily opened her lids again, laughed the blue eyes without a stain, and I untightened next the tress about her neck. Her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. Look at what he has done here. He has physically put her head in the more submissive position and his in the more dominant one. Their roles are now reversed. Now she leans on him and he looks down on her. What is particularly creepy is that he attributes vivacity and animation to the dead corpse, remarking that her blue eyes laughed and her cheek once more blushed bright beneath his burning kiss. To him, this is the perfect woman. A woman who will forever worship him, who looks alive when dead, who remains in a submissive position to him always. No longer can she ignore him, minimize him, dominate him, challenge him, upset him, leave him. Remember, it was she who came and went. In their past, he was the one who remained at home, stationary, waiting for her. And it was she who stopped the affair from being fully realized. So to him, she's more valuable dead than alive. He has set things right again according to social custom and gender codes. He reimposes patriarchal rules, putting himself in the position of power and elevating himself from a submissive child to a god, while reducing her from an independent, confident woman to a mere object on which he can project all his desires, wishes, and fantasies. In doing so, he silences her forever and revels in her now unchanging love for him. This may be Browning's way of condemning patriarchal values, for condemning a society that can't handle strong, independent women who make their own choices despite social norms. We can argue that it is his dependence on Porphyria and his feelings of powerlessness that drive him to madness, that drive him to set things as they should be. And what's even more twisted is that he attributes all this to her, thus absolving himself from any responsibility. He says, Porphyria's love, she guessed not how, her darling one wish would be heard. And thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred, and yet God has not said a word. In other words, she loved me, and she wanted to be with me, but vanity and pride in society held her back. I've made her wish come true, for here she sits with me forever together. His madness is fully understood when we realize that the silent speaker to whom he tells this episode is us. This was all told to us hours after the murder took place. He has sat like this all night with her without remorse, shame, or fear. 
Now, if you were to look at this poem's form, meter, structure, and rhyming scheme, you'll notice that it's generally written in iambic tetrameter, which means every line has eight syllables with four iams per line. Remember that an iam is an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. So, the rain set early in tonight, the soul and wind was soon awake. Like in Browning's My Last Duchess, we are dealing with the man who desperately needs to control a woman who is really uncontrollable. And the generally controlled form of the poem reflects this emotional need. It's also worth mentioning that this poem reflects a lot of masculine rhyme, meaning the lines often end in one syllable words that rhyme. And so we can argue that masculinity dominates in every which way in this poem, or at least tries to. An example of this masculine rhyme is, then glided in Porphyria straight. She shut the cold out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless great. Blaze up and all the cottage warm. So straight and great and warm and storm. But remember who we're dealing with here. This is an emotionally disturbed man who does not really have control. And this is why the poem, I think, is not fully in iambic tetrameter. In fact, the first time that it abandons it is in the line, I listened with heart fit to break. It's no accident that in the line which he admits that he's out of control, the rhythmic pattern loses control too. And Porphyria's name, being four syllables that are unstressed, stressed, unstressed, unstressed, can never fall into the rhythmic pattern that he tries to maintain. Even in name and rhythm, she is uncontrollable. This is illustrated further with the fact that prior to Porphyria's arrival, the poem is written in lines that are end-stopped, meaning there is a deliberate pause given at the end of each line to indicate control, order, and to emphasize a clear rhythmic scheme. So, the rain set early into night. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break. But the minute that Porphyria glides in, the poem begins to include all this enjambment or when the lines like flow into each other without punctuation or pause. It has a sort of jarring effect on us here because we were expecting the same pattern and control that the poem started off with. When glided in Porphyria, straight she shut the cold out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm. This tells us that when Porphyria is near him, he loses both emotional and linguistic control. And this is why the enjambment stops after he's killed her. This is a reminder that when you're studying poetry, it's essential to investigate its meter, rhythm, and form to see how it reflects the content or the mood of the poem for greater emphasis. Now, I can't leave you without encouraging you to watch my lecture on perhaps Browning's most well-known poem, My Last Duchess, as it does share a number of interesting similarities to Porphyria's Lover and is definitely worth a read. Be sure to subscribe, share this video to help others who struggle with poetry and literature in general, and join me in some of my other lectures on my channel. Be well, and I will see you guys soon.